receiving a notification that pops up asking you to consent to be recorded. Um, before we get started, um, please feel free to leave your video on if you'd like. Um, once Paolo starts talking, uh, we just ask that you mute yourself until we jump into the conversation period or the Q&A once the presentation is over. Um, my name is Megan Hastings. I'm the Assistant Director for the Center for Latin American Studies at Ohio State University. Um, we started hosting these virtual coffee hours in April uh, when we all um, were sent home to work and study um, due to the pandemic and we were really searching for a way to continue engaging with our students and faculty and our colleagues in the community. Uh, and so we've been having these, these coffee hours on various topics uh, since April, um, usually Thursdays at 1.30 Eastern Standard Time. I know there was some confusion about when this was happening um, because this is actually our first coffee hour that we're co-sponsoring with one of our partner centers. Uh, so today's coffee hour is being co-sponsored by the University of New Mexico's Latin American and Iberian Institute. Um, one of the things that we're hoping to do as we're all navigating a virtual environment and virtual learning moving into the fall is trying to find ways to collaborate with our partners and our colleagues from um, other higher education institutions across the US and, and in the region. Uh, so we were really delighted to be able to co-sponsor with their Latin American and Iberian Institute today. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over um, to Isis Baracosta. She's one of our um, faculty members and uh, class faculty affiliates here at the university. And she is going to introduce today's speaker. Isis, you can go ahead. Sure, thank you, Megan. Yeah, no, this is a great initiative. It's the first time that I see this. So the Latin American and Iberian Institute of UNM and the Center for Latin American Studies at OSU. So this is something that I always wanted to see more interaction. And I, I think we should continue this as much as possible. No. Um, so Monday, I opened my, my email and the activities and suddenly I see Paulo and I said, Paulo Dutra here at OSU, not here because nobody's going anywhere, but how is he here? So I sent him a message and said, yeah, it is me indeed. So I said, oh my goodness, like I, I have to say something about his work. This is someone uh, very dear to me who has uh, an amazing work both as a scholar and as a, as a writer, you know? Um, so like you've seen the, the description of the event, what you may not know uh, is that uh, Paolo, he was an assistant professor first at Stephen uh, F. Austin, Austin State University and now at UNM uh, of Portuguese and Spanish, no. Um, and he is a writer, a literary critic, and a professor. Uh, he describes himself in a way that I enjoy very much. So this is his very own words, open quotations. Uh, Don Quixote aficionado, Dr. Dutra is a side effect of a self-legitimate, legitimated system of privileged cultural representation that drove him into becoming an addict to short stories, writing and reading a poet and a scholar in order to escape uh, performing activities for a living that some machine could easily accomplish. Um, so uh, Paulo is the, the author of many, um, a couple of articles, many articles on uh, Machado de Assis, and he's actually working on a book length uh, uh, on, on racial issues uh, in, in Machado de Assis' works. And uh, he's also writing a book, uh, a book length project on Brazilian rap music, uh, focusing on the group Racionais MECs. Um, he's the author of a short story collection, A Versão Oficial, A Versão as One Word, Resumida, and a poetry collection obliterações, both from this uh, publishing house that is playing a very important role right now uh, in the African diaspora, mainly Brazilian, Afro-Brazilian diaspora, Malé, Malé Editorial. And um, today we have here with us uh, Emanuele Oliveira, 
who recently presented on Dutra's uh, Abliterações. I'm sorry to interrupt, but can I do this uh, uh, a little advertisement in here? Because another uh, article about uh, a version official, uh, my article on a version official will be coming forthcoming in uh, the spe Portuguese special issue of Hispania. So if you're interested in reading about a version, Paulo Dutra's a version official, my article will be coming up soon. <laughs> Sorry, and sorry. The, one, the one about abliterações, when is that coming up, Emanuele? Uh, the, the, uh, I, that I don't have uh, an idea, but the one on Aversão Oficial is going to be a forthcoming this fall in Hispania. Hence the importance of quoting Emanuele, because we do not know when you're going to be able to read what I'm going to read to you now. And it is in Portuguese, porque é uma hora do cafezinho, and because all of us should be able to speak and understand, at least understand Portuguese. Então, a Emanuele, ela diz que abliterações é um poe poemário denúncia onde a voz poética busca revelar e condenar o extermínio da população negra e pobre no Brasil. O próprio título indica um jogo palavras. Obliteração e aliteração combinando a ideia de obliteração da população marginalizada e a literação poética. No poema que dá nome ao título, um corpo jaz estraçalhado e morto pelo confete calibre 9 milímetros. Destaco que este corpo inerte, paradoxalmente, recusa-se à eliminação e invisibilidade, já que este adquire centralidade no poema. Continuando na voz da Emanuele, já era, na verdade a voz do, do Paulo, declara a voz poética na estrofe 6, no mote fatalista. Entretanto, o corpo emerge, tornando-se poema, adquirindo uma materialidade na palavra. É um corpo morto que se recusa a morrer, aviltando os sentidos olfativos e visuais dos leitores com suas grotescas imagens. Um corpo preto, uma referência à raça, e vermelho, o sangue, expondo, e aqui a palavra exposição é importante, a violência dos aparelhos repressivos do Estado. Paulo Dutra traz sua vivência de acadêmico não convencional para sua poesia e o seu conto. O autor sujeito negro e periférico que trabalha a linguagem denunciando as obliterações do corpo negro. A sua experiência marca sua fala. Os corpos de Paulo Dutra vivem a morte diariamente, mas de forma teimosa recusam-se a morrer. E Emanuele, no final, ela fala sobre o desafio da obra, e daí a gente está falando da poesia e dos contos, de pensar, que, que o trabalho do, do Paulo Dutra nos oferece, o desafio de pensar um projeto literário que é político e estético, e sendo assim também ético. Né? Então, o, o trabalho do Paulo Dutra tem essa importância né, do, do acadêmico não convencional, que, que a gente quer que seja, é, que se torne cada vez mais convencional. Né? Convencional não, mas... E uma coisa interessante, quando a gente lê a obra do the scholar Paulo Dutra, né, o acadêmico, isso acontece com alguns escritores, é o que a gente lê principalmente nas notas de rodapé. Parece que o sujeito, o escritor, se revela nas notas de rodapé, quase como fosse uma, uma escrita paralela. Então, num escrito sobre Machado de Assis, numa nota de rodapé, e agora eu cito Paulo Dutra para fechar essa apresentação, ele diz Não é incomum, ainda hoje, depararmos-nos com depoimentos de pessoas mestiças relatando situações incômodas quando admitidas em ambientes estritamente brancos. Não é incomum, tampouco, depararmos-nos com a expressão mimimi, em respostas a depoimentos desse caráter. Mais comum ainda é a tácida ideia 
baseada na ideia vigente, para muitos, democracia racial, de que a vítima desse dolorido infortúnio está imaginando coisas. Por isso, creio que é sim importante aventar essa possibilidade no conto de Machado. Os famigerados elevadores sociais, em contraposição aos também famigerados elevadores de serviço, de cujo serviço os não-brancos são convidados a fazer uso. Podem atestar tal fato. Então, aqui vocês vão, uma pequena ideia do, do trabalho do, do Paulo Dutra e a apresentação a, dele vai, vai na linha, vai na esteira do trabalho, por exemplo, de Selma Vital, né? a Quase Brancos, Quase Pretos, sobre a obra de Machado de Assis, e os vários escritos do Eduardo de Assis Duarte. Né? Os escritos de Caramujo é, é o de mais fôlego. Assim. É, então, nessa esteira vem o trabalho de Paulo Dutra, que está aqui com nós, apesar de eu não ver o seu quadradinho. Paulo, identifique-se. Aqui, aqui estamos. Can I go home now already? Not yet. You have well, to I'm at home, so. talk to us. So, well, I think first of all, welcome you all to my home. Um, I would like to, of course, thank the, the Latin American and Iberian Institute here at UNM. And um, in, um, thanks to Marlene. She was uh, the contact here. Uh, thanks, Marlene, for your patience. <laughs> And also, I would like to thank the Center for Latin American Studies at the Ohio State University um, for the opportunity to be here talking about uh, my work on Machado de Assis, but also to be here sharing this experience with so many um, familiar faces and some familiar names, because I don't see everybody's face, but I see their names. And also with so many unfamiliar faces and unfamiliar names. Thank you all very much for being here. A special thanks go to Isis, of course. Um, she, she, she contacted me saying that, oh, is that you? Yeah, that's me. No, we need to do that. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Isis, for the very uh, kind uh, introduction. I feel like I have, a, now I have a, the whole world in my shoulders now. Claro, vai, vai, vai o peso. Do my best. And I always. Junto. <laughs> okay. <laughs> always, um, I like always to thank Emanuele, minha madrinha. Well, one of one of minhas madrinhas in uh, in this work. Thank you, Emanuele, for being here too. Thank you all. Thank to some of my colleagues here at UNM. I see their names. I see some of their faces. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I was surprised when I was approached. Uh, I don't know why someone uh, decided to contact me, but um, I am glad that we are here. I will, well, it's called Cafe Conversaciones, right? So I will try to be as casual as possible. Um, that's, why, that's why I didn't even shave, you know? Um, And I will uh, be sharing a uh, PowerPoint slide. Oh, I forgot to say a special thanks to Megan as well. Thanks, Megan. And nice to meet you. I will be sharing my, my uh, screen. It is a PowerPoint um, presentation. I would suggest you guys, if you can, um, you, you drag the cameras to the to the right to the top right if you can of your screen because that way um you're gonna see the powerpoint better can you all see the powerpoint can you hear me well okay so like i said i'll try to be as casual as possible um i will be uh following a a script that i have here um i try not to read <laughs> from it but sometimes uh, it may happen. So um, as you can see, you see the title of my presentation, 
um, maybe if you want if you want to at the end we can talk about why I choose this title uh, and you have my information um, they convinced me to go to Instagram so now I have uh, Instagram accounts and you guys can uh, follow me there that how you say like follow yeah you can follow me on Instagram <laughs> so <clears throat> without further ado I would like you guys to please refer to the PowerPoint presentation that starts right now. Pensar no futuro é algo tão importante que até os imortais fazem isso. Conhecido como o bruxo do Cosme Velho, Machado de Assis foi o fundador e o primeiro presidente da Academia Brasileira de Letras. E o universo das letras não era o único lugar onde o maior escritor brasileiro tinha o seu merecido destaque. Doutor Machado, que possa ajudar o nosso ilustre escritor, vem fazendo o que faço todos os meses, o depósito na poupança. A história de Machado com a Caixa durou anos, tanto que a Caixa esteve presente até um dos seus últimos escritos, seu testamento. Possui também várias quantias recolhidas à Caixa Econômica em caderneta número 14.304. Caixa 150 anos, uma história escrita por todos os brasileiros. So I'm gonna go ahead to the next slide. Bear with me, please. Em respeito à história da Caixa e em respeito ao povo brasileiro, apresentamos Machado de Assis. Conhecido como o bruxo do Cosme Velho, Machado de Assis foi o fundador e o primeiro presidente da Academia Brasileira de Letras. E o universo das letras não era o único lugar onde o maior escritor brasileiro tinha o seu merecido destaque. Doutor Machado, o que posso ajudar o nosso ilustre escritor? Sem saber o que faço todo mês. Um depósito na caderneta de poupança. A história de Machado com a Caixa durou anos. Tanto que a Caixa esteve presente até um dos seus últimos escritos. Seu testamento. Possui também várias quantias recolhidas à Caixa Econômica. Em caderneta número 14.304. Caixa 150 anos. História escrita por um, so what you guys just saw um, it was a TV commercial, a TV ad. It was uh, in 2011. Uh, and by the way, um, I want to thank you, my nephew, Andrea Lucas Borges, for helping me with the technology. Um, so the 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 two ads they are from they are they were they aired in 2011 and as you could see uh, the brazilian bank caixa econômica federal uh, in brazil you have two major uh, public banks that means they are uh, run by uh, the government the banco do brasil and the caixa econômica federal um, and as you can see in the first uh, uh, version they hired a white actor to represent Marcelo de Assis. Um, and of course, there were uh, heated reactions, right? Discussions and from the public. So they went ahead and ordered a new one in which a black actor played the role of Marshall Justice. Um, if you guys uh, could see it, aside from this new introduction with, um, I always forget his name, but he plays Majestad in Karanjuru. Uh, Ayuton, I think it's his name. Don't mind. Well, anyhow. Aside from this new introduction, and um, that clearly, like it, it's uh, it's apologetic, right? Uh, they apologize and acknowledge the mistake, uh, and the change in the racial makeup, a white actor to a black act actor, and some people will say it is an exaggeration. They may say that he, the second actor, is maybe too dark, his his skin may be too dark, um, but you, if you guys noticed, nothing else changed in the commercial, right? And I, I'm showing you uh, photos from the, the two versions so you guys can see it. Both versions imply that he, Machado de Assis, in spite of the, the color of his skin, he achieved, experienced, and more important, 
accepted this social category that suggests respectability, civilized civilization, civilized control, appropriateness, that we today we call whiteness as a category, right? Um, if I'm not mistaken, when the second commercial um, came, came out, the conversation was over. So now it's fine. Uh, we are not mad anymore. Um, but then if you think about it, you see that the bank still thinks, right, that the only thing they had to do was to replace the color of the skin of the actor, right? And everybody was happy um, uh, from, from, from that time on. But um, whether he embraced this category of whiteness, I think it is a, is a topic that remains to be debated. We can talk about it, we can debate it. But I stand in this position, my position is that there should be no question that he was a black man who produced his work within the culture specific and the temporary specific conditions that being black at that time offered him. This is, like I said, this is, this is my position. This is how I, I, I think about it. And um, as Easy uh, mentioned before, um, the name of Eduardo Justice Duarte, and by the way, he just relaunched the, they launched the third edition of that book. Malay launched the third edition of that book. I have it, but it's back home in Brazil because I cannot have it uh, shipped here yet. Um, so, According to, to him, to Eduardo C. Duarte, Machado's literary profile, and I quote, was made so Western that it would end up leaving its mark not only upon the public image constructed throughout time, but even upon physical appearance in the uh, Caixa Econômica uh, Commercial, uh, Caixa Econômica Federal um, Commercial attests that, right? Um, <laughs> So there's, there's the assumption then, um, until maybe some two, two decades ago, is that he wrote as someone who was not worried about racial issues or slavery at all. That was the assumption, right? That is, there was always someone who tried to, um, to debate this assumption, but uh, in the last two decades, it, it grew uh, stronger. Um, so here I'm providing you, again, uh, thanks to Andre, and I hope it works, with several of, of images that you can find on the internet. You can find all of them on the internet. And Andre Lucas put them together for me. That's the beard I'm trying to achieve. So there are several images, uh, but there is also, there are also more, and uh, please bear with me. This one was, um, oops, I thought I would do this. This one is a new uh, photograph of him that according to the information that I had was found by, by, by um, was like an accident, someone, um, a person called Felipe Hisato was looking for uh, images of uh, another person from that time. And uh, he find in an archive in Europe, this photo that was published in an Argentinian magazine um, in uh, January of 1908. So this photo uh, prompted um, a lot of questions, a lot of uh, debate again. And now what we have is that um, new um, images, new possibilities for images of him have been created. And uh, the, the two other images, the one in the middle and the one to the right of the PowerPoint, they are being used in uh, publications. The idea was the project Machado de Assis Real. They came up with this photo you can find it on, the, on, the, on the internet. Uh, they encourage you to download it and get your old books that you have of Machado de Assis and replace the photo with this new one. Um, and I think I also should mention that Malay already did it. 
they launched a new um, edition uh, with uh, works of Marshall Yassis. They, they did not replace the, the old photo. They actually used the new photo um, at, uh, uh, as a cover. <clears throat> so, but there is, there is more. <laughs> so with all this going on, back in the, uh, the 90s or the 80s, Machado de Assis was also, his, his, his photo was used um, in the Brazilian uh, currency bill at the time. As you can see, mil cruzado, uh, and he and now he he's blue, <laughs> he's bluish, but that has nothing to do with the issue because uh, that's how the bills were made, and uh, 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 the other figures they were like reddish or uh, yellowish, uh, it following the the pattern of the bill. But I think it's curious. Uh, that is also this one that was you can find on the website on the internet too and of course i don't think i need to say and think about it you can see it <laughs> you can see it but that is also this one <laughs> which uh you can also find and find an anchor anyhow those are uh, many possibilities of uh depiction of martiality as seeds right but um, moving, moving forward, I was supposed to have another slide here, but I think I messed up. But before I go into father against mother, I need to say this. Um, so coming back to the assumptions, right? The assumptions was that he never wrote about race or uh, slavery. He, he, was, he did not worry about it. And I can provide uh, two examples of scholarship and scholars who, who, who taught so. One is uh, Domis Proença Filho, and the other one is David uh, Brookshaw. Proença Filho, he believed that Machado de Assis never created a black character who is a protagonist. And he also believed that in general, this was true for the majority of the texts in Brazil. Um, he also believed that in general, uh, black characters are portrayed by means of stereotypes. And we all know that he's not too far from the truth here. Um, but as I will show later, I'll try to show later, there is an assumption in this, uh, there is an assumption within this assumption. Uh, and I think it can be challenged. It has been challenged. <clears throat> um, Brookshaw believed, and I'll quote Brookshaw, his work is never concerned um, with the question of race. And he also uh, said that, and I quote again, Machado de Assis is the classic example of the mulatto who devoted his life to being accepted above the comportment line and therefore studiously avoided any reference to his origins. Um, this is a casual conversation, right? I cannot uh, I cannot talk about everything. I will, like I said, I'll try to be as casual as possible. And maybe some, some, some things will not be um, clear, but then we have um, time later to, to talk about, so you guys can ask, ask questions. Today, for the, for the purpose of this, uh, for this conversation, uh, I will talk, I will concentrate on the issue of his characters. And uh, like Izzy said, it's not exactly my idea. Selma Vital has already uh, talked about this. She called attention to uh, she called attention to the fact that we all we all me too we all grew accustomed to assuming that his characters are, are white, just like us. Selma's not not me, just like. Uh, um, and then following this idea, what if we read his texts, assuming? that they are not white, right? So that's the, the basic idea. And now we come to the, to the slide that, I, that, I, that I'm showing. I'm gonna use these slides because I don't have time to um, make a summary of the short stories. So for those of you who are not familiar with the short stories, there's a brief uh, summary description of what is going on in the short story. So Father Against Mother, Pai Contra Mãe, it's probably the most debated uh, of Machado's texts when it comes to race and slavery, probably. Um, both scholars and readers uh, assume that Kanjinho, the main character, 
who started work as a slave catcher in order to provide for his family, uh, is white. While other assume, other people, other scholars, other readers, they assume that he's not white. <laughs> some people think he's white, some people think he's not white. Uh, and several articles has been, have been uh, written about it uh, so far. Um, and although there is no physical description, and I, charge, and I challenge you guys to actually find a physical description of the character, that is, that is none. Most people will actually say, like, he's white or he's, he's, he's black. He, they will, assign, they will assign, assign him a race, a specific race. And it's, of course, right, he must be. He, must, he, can, he, he cannot be, uh, let's say, um, Japanese, right, or Asian. He must be um, a Brazilian character, right, at the time. But there is no way for us to tell it today. But this is just a, a teaser. I will not be discussing Father Against Mother today because this is a pro project that I'm still working on. It's a future project. But I, I would suggest to everybody the reading of short story uh, by Toni Morrison, Recitatif. I don't know if I can pronounce that. It's a French word. Uh, it's R-E-C-I-C-I-T-A-T-I-F, F, sorry. Because Morrison, in that, in that uh, short story, she created um, two female characters, Twilight and Roberta. And you can see some information on the, on the, on the uh, PowerPoint. <clears throat> um, I mentioned this short story, like I said, because she created two, two cards, while as Twilight and Roberta. And we know, as you can see in the PowerPoint, that one of them is white and the other is black. But we cannot say who is black and who is the white, who is the black one and who is the white one because the author put in the text codes and signs that can function for both for black and white females. But again, with these short stories, most people would say Twilight is black and Roberta is white. Roberta is white and Twilight is black. And they say, why? And they go through these uh, little stereotypes. And I think in the PowerPoint, that is one. I'm not going to talk about this. But in the, in, the, in the PowerPoint, you can see one of the stereotypes that can uh, prompt people to choose to assign a race. Uh, either white or black to Twilight Roberta. We can talk about this later if you guys want. Um, so basically what I do is that I, I apply this idea, this, this, the Morrison's, Tony Morrison's idea, when I try to read uh, Machado's uh, work. Today I'm going to talk about uh, Midnight Mass, which is uh, Misa do Galo, and how to be a big wig, which is Teoria do Medallion. I confess that I don't know what a big wig is. I read on the internet and I, I don't think a medallion is a big wig, but uh, we need to be thankful to the, translate, to the translators anyway, <laughs> because um, they facilitate our work and, uh, and also um, I don't think medallion can be translated. So. so you have a description that I found on the internet, it's like a, Summary of the of the main idea of the short story by Eva Paulino Bueno. You guys can follow that while I talk about this because, like I said, it's just a so for those of you who are not familiar with the text, you can get an idea. Um, so Midnight Mass is basically the story of an adult man recollecting a conversation with a married white lady in her house while her husband is with his mistress. And it is a, a, a New Year's Eve. And uh, the, the narrator, at the time, he was 17 years old. She may or may not have, uh, as young people say today, hit on him, right? She may or may not have uh, made a move on him. Uh, but the first approaches to the story went more or less like this. Did it happen? Or did he just imagine it? This um, possibility, uh, this possible encounter with the with the uh, with Donna Conceição. And again, there is no description of the male character, but there are codes mm -hmm. in, in the text that, uh, in the context of the short story, would function both for a white or for a black young man in the in the at the time. 
So if you are reading him as a white teenager, the story will, the story will, uh, will still be great, of course, right? It's Machado. Regarding narrative technique and all the all that is impl implied in this recollection of memories and, and all that. Uh, but what if you read him as a black? On top of being that great, the short story already, we can start to grasp to grasp the complicated positions of a young black man in relation to the white woman. And uh, and here we can of course. Uh, Think about Fanon's uh, chapter on the black man and the white woman. Um, I think it's in the, on the black faces. I don't remember the name. I'm really bad uh, with that. But you, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, so how would be the relation of a young black man in relation to a white woman in the 19th century Rio de Janeiro society? Another aspect that we can start to grasp is Machado's take on the racial make racial makeup of Rio de Janeiro. And again, this, these are just uh, teasers, okay? Um, again, I am providing you guys with uh, a little uh, uh, pieces, little pieces of the short story, uh, and I'm going to talk about how to be a big wig, Teoria do Medallion. So how to be a big wig is a dialogue between a father and his son after the son's birthday dinner party. He turned 20, 21. It is very famous in Brazil. And even, peop even people who never read it probably have heard of it as in some kind of anecdote. Just like people who never read Don Quixote, they have heard about Don Quixote. And here I'm talking about Brazil. Of course, I'm not talking about the whole world, but I am, positive that most people in Brazil somehow must have heard about uh, this story. So usually this story is read as a satira, satira, I don't know how to pronounce that in English, of the white elites and of the time, of the time. And this is also, even Eduardo de Assis Duarte uh, says that, because the father allegedly teach his, teach his son how to be neutral, how to be a medallion. Again, I cannot translate medallion, so I thought that I would use the word, use the word neutral, like never take any, uh, an, any, any, any stand. As we say in Brazil, estar em cima do muro, or something like that. So to be neutral in every aspect of life and employ social, linguistic, um, so many uh, tools in order to always be neutral and therefore achieve success in life in general. There are several codes that can be and where we're promptly associated with whiteness. Uh, but just like in, in, in Toni Morrison's short story, if we take a second look at them, we, we can see that they would work for black men too, for white men and black men in Brazil at the time. Um, he has a degree, he has some money put away, and I think, yeah, you have the, the translation there and the, the excerpt from the excerpt from the text. He has a degree, he has some money put away, etc. And once again, there is no description of the characters. Well, there is one. It's um, the father mentioned that he's now a grown man, hombre hecho y derecho, with a mustache, with a fine mustache. As you see, you saw under the, the other slide, Longus Bigotis. They translate as a fine mustache. Um, and here's a fun, funny fact, if I think it's funny, if you guys don't, don't know about it. A mustache was supposed to be a symbol that white men of the elite, rich white men, would boast, ostentar, right? They would wear it as a symbol of their social position. Uh, and Machado de Assis was accused of wearing a mustache in order to look less black, to, to somehow look less black. Do I look less black? I don't know. Um, and you could see in the photos that we saw before that he did wear a mustache. And personally, I don't see how it makes him less black. Uh, we can talk about this. And besides, why would they tamper with his figure? Because 
we know that they tamper with, uh, with the, the, the photographs, with the, the, the images, right? If the, mus the mustache was already uh, made, making him white, right? Anyhow, it's just a thought. Like I said, it's a casual conversation. Let's pretend we're all having, uh, well, we are having coffee and beer and it may, it may be 5 p.m. somewhere, right? Um, so, and I ask again, going back to my idea, what if Jean Jean and his father, or one of them, they are not exactly white, right? If they are not white, the father's advice may claim several new meanings, right? And I will mention two possibilities. Um, so what if you think that, this, that here we have a father instructing his son on how to survive in a racist society? That his degree and social position may not be enough for him to get by. And, uh, and I, I would like you guys to, to pay attention to the, to the PowerPoint presentation, because you can see that he, um, the father says, um, podes entrar no parlamento, na magistratura, na lavoura, na imprensa, na lavoura, na indústria, no comércio, nas letras ou nas artes. That's what uh, his diploma could uh, get him, where this, his diploma could get him. And I did, I confess that, that back in time, I would read this as a literal uh, statement, possibilities. But today, I read it as a irony, achieved through hyperbole. You get this degree, you can do whatever you want. Uh, mm. So I repeat, maybe the father is instructing his son on how to survive in a racist society. Um, that his degree and his good social position may not be enough for him to get by. Um, and I may, I may be saying something here that um, many of you will disagree, but I also think about mothers today educating their sons on how to behave in order to go unnoticed. And I'm talking about black sons, right? Especially go unnoticed to bad police officers. Maybe Machado was depicting by means of first-class literature. It is first-class literature. We, we need to remember that. His own path while he negotiated living in a slave-owned society as an estiso. And here, of course, I'm talking about Machado de Assis as a person, but uh, he was an agregado. And you can see the agregado many times in his literature. It is something that he would put in his literature, the agregado. And um, I don't know how to translate that either, but we can do that later. Um, I don't think there are, there are no agregados here in this uh, culture, in this society, I think. Um, so, facts. He never exposed himself to the public, right? We only know him through his writings. But yet, we grew accustomed to reading his work as uh, as if everything about it was pertaining to a white word only, right? Uh, and I wanna say that Machado may have been actually creating black characters as protagonists, and we cannot see it because our own assumptions about race relations in the 19th century, and of course, because of the whitening process in Brazil, and also because we ended up accepting that every black character were actually depicted by means of negative stereotypes, uh, like for instance, Filho believed. But remember Maria Firmina dos Reis now. Uh, so I believe we should all give Machado the benefit of the doubt. Um, I'm almost done. I'm, I don't know how much time I, I, I use so far. But uh, one thing that I think is worth mentioning is that I think, and I think I can make the case, that Machado was probably a person who saw right through Rio de Janeiro society and the extremely complicated race relations. And then he wrote about it in a unique way and from a unique perspective under the parameters, again, of literature as an art. We can never forget that he was an artist. His work, and the way he tackled the issues of this time are just 
so very different from other authors. So very different. But that is not what I want to say, actually. What I want to say is that, and here in the case of both Midnight Mass and How to Be a Big Wig, when he raises the character's race, like I said, the codes, they function for both black and white people. Did, didn't he then propose to see us as people and not as white people or black people? And if the characters are indeed black, although there is no direct mention to it, to this fact, has he not presented them as people and not as black people? Maybe he achieved what Toni Morrison um, did um, years later. And his, 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 the, <coughs> sorry, here is Toni Morrison's um, own take on her short story. And I think that information needs to be updated because she did wrote, she did write other short stories um, after that. But at the time, that was the only one. Um, so, I do understand. I understand that I may be stretching it. Okay, I, I get it. But I want you all to remember that it, it is true that Machado never associated himself publicly with his African heritage. It is also just as true that he never associated himself publicly with his other heritage. Some, and I have read about it, some will also say that he possessed a multiracial identity. And I think that means that he would have like free transit between two words. Uh, and I'm still trying to, but I'm not sure that I can agree or that I will agree with, with that. But again, another uh, teaser that then, because then we can, maybe we can talk about it later. But I must acknowledge, I must, I must give it to, to, to those who think um, like this. It is a possibility. But one thing is for sure, the white Machado was imagined and created by a society that desired and unfortunately still desire to achieve whiteness. And like I said, as a category. Um, so I may have said many um, polemic uh, stuff, many polemic things. <laughs> so I'll let you choose your own Machado. Okay, I prefer this one. And I prefer this one because on top of everything, reading Machado is fun. It's really, really, really fun. Thank you, obrigado. Oof. I need water. Someone take over, please. <laughs> não, peraí, embora não. Você ainda, ainda, agora que a gente pode conversar, Paulo, por favor. Muitíssimo. Obrigada, Paulo, this, this great presentation, and um, like we, we can, for those interested, we can send the, the link to some of the, the articles that Paulo wrote about uh, the stories that he mentions, among others, in which he goes into more detail. So for those thinking that, um, that the reading that Paulo Dutra is suggesting that is something overly far-fetched, uh, I would strongly suggest uh, to take a, a look at his, at his writings to see how he goes into details, like from the, the idea of comborsa, you no, know, instead of using the word lover, amante, like this word comborsa that appears uh, in Machado de Assis, also in other uh, writings, and that uh, that Paulo is even going to look into the meaning of it in Guinea-Bissau, you know? And then, like, as, as you talk about it, like, it's uh, the fact that, for instance, in the in the case of Missa do Gallo, no? How is it in English? Uh, Missa do Gallo. Yeah the fact that uh, the, the character is reading Dumas, that the reference, uh, the, the only other novel that there is reference to is Moreninha, the, the question of agregado, which is very interesting. So agregado, I, I don't even think there is a word in English for this. So it's, a, it's a, an outside... Another side called a, 
uh, translated as, as a dependent. Dependent, I guess. So some, someone that lives as a member of the family without being a member of the family, which like for some would be the description of Machado de Assis in the society that, that he lives, no? Like so, like, uh, and then like something that, that anybody who reads the story is going to remember is the descriptions of the very white skin of this woman that at first appears ugly, then, then interesting, but describing like how he, they can see the veins all through, through, through her skin. So it's, th this reading makes a lot of sense when, when it put it uh, that way. And uh, the importance of us rethinking the, the 19th century through, um, through a different prism, no, that, that we are used to, how, how crucially informative it is to, to our present. Uh, Luana commented on Ailton Graça, uh, we couldn't remember, and uh, like, uh, I'm going to open the, muito obrigada, Paulo, abrir a, a discussão, open the, the floor for comments, suggestions, those of you that want to destroy Paulo, how do you dare? <laughs> Fernando, talvez você que está tá sugerindo em Dom Casmurro that, that Caldwell is going to uh, translate agregado as dependent. What do you think about this, this translation? I know, actually, when uh, when Paulo mentioned that he was not sure about how to translate, I just grabbed the book <laughs> right behind him myself uh -huh. and look at what was her option. And I think it works. And I also I also think I, I'm uh, quite impressed by Paulo's presentation uh, because it's a fact that uh, Machado de Assis is very uh, very cautious about the physical description, depiction of uh, characters. It's uh, very, I use it to make the fun of that with my former students in Brazil. They would read one, uh, one short story, then I would ask them the physical, uh, physical traces of one single character, and I would agree with anything they said. Mm. And in the end, I would read the, the depiction and there was absolutely nothing there. Uh, blonde hair, blah, 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 nothing. He only says she's like this, she was, she was perky, she was something. And from that perspective, it's a very, I think, a very uh, fertile idea to try to think as a strategic way of not addressing the major issue that is race and above all in uh, in first person uh, narrators because they can always be the non-white gaze exactly. upon brazilian society that's mm -hmm. a very interesting way to make a twist and uh and bring, bring to Marshall uh narratives the central issue of race and uh, race relations. Instead of looking on the surface, looking underneath, uh, looking on the gaze that first person characters, why not consider any first person character, uh, first person uh, narrator, of Marshall Justice as a, um, a, a, possi a possibility of being uh, miscegenated and being uh, mixed race. And precisely because of this economy of descriptions, when there is a description, one has to pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. Now it's not, it's not casual, Paulo no. talks about I, this. If I, can, if I can say so, like um, I talked about just two short stories, but I have a 
another one that's a uh, Admiral's Knight, <laughs> Noite de Almirante. And, uh, and in that story, he says that Genoveva is a caboclinha, a cabocla, mm -hmm. a uh, person. And uh, José Diogo, who is uh, another character, he's a peddler. And I, and I look and I look it up and I found three sources that say that peddlers were white people. Although I just read a book um, from a uh, scholar from here, uh, from the United States. He says peddlers were not white, but he does not provide any source. So I'm leaning towards uh, yeah. that peddlers were not white. They were white, actually. Uh, and then we have the main character, Simen, the, the sailor, Deolindo Venta Grande. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then yeah. my take is that, okay, Venta Grande. Right, and it was translated as a big nose, which again, it's not the nose that is big, it's the nostrils. And we know that venta is a um, derogative word used to address our ventas. <laughs> yeah. um, so I discussed this in the short story that actually what Machado did was, oh, first he has the three main uh, races can you see my hands, uh, quote unquote, races yeah. of Brazil uh, in the short story. And uh, uh, one is white, one is black, and one is uh, mixed race, right, is, uh, is the cabocla. But the white guy is not in the short story. He's just referred to. Uh -huh. So it's, um, and again, nobody never paid attention to his, to this description as venta grande. Uh, big nostrils. Yeah. So I agree with you, Fernando. The, yeah. the, the way he, he does or does not uh, describe the characters are, is just as important as anything else. In, in but not, uh, and uh, the one thing that just uh, occurred to me right now, uh, not, we can also push, push the, uh, the line further and I'm thinking of, uh, for example, Um Homem Celebre. Yes. Because Pestana tries and tries and tries, but he never succeeds in writing a uh, prestigious mm -hmm. right. kind of music, only polkas. If we try to read against the grain and uh, consider Pestana as a mixed race, uh, the, the story will transfigurate behind, uh, in front of ourselves by being this guy trying to be accepted by uh, some kind of legitimate world, cultural world, but he never succeeds because he's, he's tied to his uh, popular origins. Yes, um, there is, um, I think the name of the article is Machado Machishi. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, help me out. What's his name? Uh, Pistana. I know. No, the on the name of the of, of the scholar. Yeah, the scholar. No, I it's can't famous. remember. I. Uh... Ah, my goodness. I do not know Machado Machishi. I Machado don't know. Machishi. Yeah, it's 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 um, it's it's published in the Revista Teresa. Okay. And um, Viznik, Viznik, it's by Viznik. Ah. And ah. Machado okay. Machishi. Yes, he writes about uh, uh, Pistana. And uh, he implies, or he makes it clear that Pestana is, is um, maybe a mulatto, mm. because mulattoes were actually uh, um, the musicians of the time. Most of those musicians uh, that actually um, played or tried to do what Pestana does, they were uh, mulattoes. There is also this, uh, um, it's not clear, but he may be a son of a um, Catholic priest as well. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and I also um, like I, I showed this book. I wrote the foreword, and I also and I'm glad you you brought this up because I mentioned I also mentioned Woman Celebrity uh, and several other uh, short stories. Lucia, do you have your hand raised, or was it an impression? No, I I didn't. But I can ask a question <laughs> about the the title, the sold out. What does, you know, what is the, uh, 
reference. What are you trying to reference when you say sold out? In fact, Easy thought that was the talk was sold out. <laughs> oh my goodness, Megan. Oh. Like I, ha I want to see Paolo. The event is sold out already. Well, yeah. um, I, am, I am a learning of, uh, of languages and how language change and all that. And I am very, I, I'm always consulting the Urban Dictionary for English. <laughs> and I actually find, found out that sold out means that you are totally dedicated to something. When you are totally dedicated to something, you are sold out. Mm -hmm. And also recently, uh, and it is a true story, uh, one of the translations of Memorias Postumas de Brás Cubas sold out, sold out in the very first day. Uh, you, and, and it's funny because a friend of mine, he bought a note version and he said, oh, I was able to buy it. I'm like, no, this is a note translation. So Machado was, was selling even the other translations because people were trying to find it. Um, so my idea, and I think it is, and again, it's not very scholarly. I understand that, please, but this is a casual conversation. My idea is to make a stand here today that Machado was sold out. He was totally dedicated to race and racial issues because we, I don't think we can um, picture the best author in Brazil, right? We, I don't think we can accept that he was not talking about the most important uh, topic issue in Brazil at the time. So I think he was sold out <laughs> to race and racial issues, but he, uh, of course, he did in a different way from other authors uh, in his own, own way. And again, people will say, well, but you cannot really say that he was black, that he was actually um, uh, worried about black people, worried about racial issues. You cannot say the opposite either. <laughs> and it has been said for over a century, right? So this is just me as a person, uh, like someone uh, close to me, uh, well, two people close to me, one of them say that I am Tuhan, and the other say that I am Pihacento, and I don't know how to translate that in English, Pihacento, Berinche uh, in Espanol, right? I am like that, I make, I make this stand to actually sell Machado de Assis as a sold out person that was race and racial issues. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I know he may, he, he may have not been, and I know that, but we cannot really know. We need to, to dig in, into his writing, into his texts, to, um, to build um, a reasoning, an argument. Oh, and, and you do so. Paulo, Andrew made a comment here that, that I think you would enjoy. Andrew, maybe yeah. <laughs> you would like to do so with your own voice. Yes. Sure. So, so as you mentioned, using that term sold out, I thought about it in terms of music. So in music context, you say you've sold out. In rap, often it's used to mean someone who has left authentic themes behind in order to become commercially successful. I'm more familiar with kind of rock and that side as well of, you know, doing what's popular rather than what's truly and authentically used. So that even adds another level of nuance. I know that's not your intention, but that's even another one of his performing to, could it be a comment on performing to whiteness for commercial success? Yeah, un, un vendido, as we say in Portuguese. It is, it is one of the, <laughs> the, the, the possibilities. Thanks, Andrew, appreciate it. Poderia perguntar, Paulo, teria alguns comentários e uma pergunta sobre mais sobre a imagem do Machado, pode ser? Estou aqui para isso. Ok. É, ok, so, um, I, I, I had a couple of comments. When you said, I thought it was, so, I, I know your work and your book, I'm, I've been following your work and uh, it's so interesting. And it's so, uh, I think it beautifully touches on the complexities of the racial system in Brazil. Uh, I thought it was interesting how you uh, said the uh, uh, Teoria de, de, do Medallion uh, deals with codes that fun function for both white people or black people, but certainly white people and black people in the upper classes, because there were black people, or, uh, mestizos, mulatos in the upper classes, right? Uh, uh, but not for the, the lower classes, right? 
Uh, I'm also very interested in this idea of Machado's multiracial identity that it, I think is very underexplored and that you're doing so well. And I love, uh, you have to put this in your book, I love the concept of choose your own Machado. And I, that, that's uh, so fascinating because I think that's what Machado was playing with right? Uh, uh, you, you have to choose him. My question now, uh, uh, it's in regards of the images. Uh, that's also a project that I, I, I expect to do a little later. Um, and uh, you showed several and some updated images of Machado. And Machado is so iconic that I thought, I, comparing, for example, with Bolivar, right? The, the image of Simon Bolivar, right? Um, why is that there is not a queer image of Machado? When you find so many, uh, like of Simon Bolivar, even Che Guevara, right? Uh, why is not, or is that something that will be coming? What, what, what do you think about this? What, why we cannot queer our Machado? <laughs> um, just a comment. I was, I was. Uh, thanks for the comments and the question. I was, uh, I'm not as or organized as Fernando. He promptly found found a book. I was trying to, but I couldn't. No, mine, uh, mine is not organized <laughs> at all. I'm just that? blessed with a good memory. <laughs> just that. There is a, it's, for me, it's mandatory reading now. It's a Machado de Assis multiracial identity and the Brazilian novelist is a book length. Uh, it's a book by um, uh, G. Reginald Daniel. I think he is a professor of sociology in California. At UCLA, yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah, so he has this book, Machado de Assis multiracial identity and the Brazilian novelist. Mandatory reading um, if we want to to talk about uh, racial issues in Machado de Assis. And I know there is also a, um, someone defended a PhD dissertation maybe a year or two ago. I have the file somewhere on my computer, but um, um, I was doing something else so I could not get to, to that yet. But uh, it is, um, I, I think it's, it's going to become also military reading. Now, Emanuele, that question is for, is for Cesar Baraga Pinto, not for me. <laughs> but I don't think he is here. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, and I don't think it's going to work with that. It, it's, it's on you, Paolo. <laughs> um, why don't we have a queer image of Michelle Gassis? I... I don't know. Do we have queer images of other authors from that time? Brazilian authors? Hmm. That's an interesting thing. I don't think so. Should I, should I then dare to say that it's just a reflect of how Brazilian society developed <laughs> um, in the 20th century? I, I have no idea. It's the thing. Oh, yeah. What do you what do you guys think? Why don't we have <laughs> a queer image of Machado de Assis? Because I think uh, I think you can read. It has been done. You can read. Uh, um, you can read a queer in se several of the of the literature produced in Brazil in the nineteenth century, the beginning of twentieth um, uh, century, when Machado was writing. Um, but I, I think I think you you have a very uh, profitable, proficuous uh, point because I don't remember seeing any queer image of authors from that time, Machado or you know Barreto. Wait, wait, you do you do refer at least to to uh, Valente, Luis Fernando Valente, the question of mm -hmm. the the wounded the wound wound okay. male. So yes. there there is. I think that's the closest. Uh, so, well, Cesar Baraga Pinto. He also, if I'm not mistaken, I reviewed his book. He also uh, mentions uh, in some in some in some uh, stent 
uh, queerness. Uh, but he's not talking about Michelle Deceased, he's talking about other authors. There was one that I don't remember, a critic in Brazil who was who wrote something about the homosocial uh, connection between uh, the Benchinho and Escobar. And that was very, very interesting, saying that Benchinho was actually a repressed homosexual and that yeah. because it, there, there is an, this homosexual social connection between you know, the Benchini is go by, but anyway, I will have to go. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Paulo. Thank you so much, Easy's and everyone for it. This, is, this was so great. Thank you so much. I will be in touch. Bye-bye. <laughs> Tchau, Emanuele. Talvez tenha uma, uma citação do citação, uma citação da citação que o Fernando usa, que não é que não é bem o que vocês estão querendo, mas seria o paralelo mais. Fernando, por favor, a, a citação que você usa de vez em quando, como Bom. diria Machado de Assis. <risos> Sim. Sim. Eu, eu uso. Como diria Machado de Assis? Pau no cu. <risos> Sim, deixa. Mas é a foto. But I think, I, I, like I said, I think it's a very interesting question because yeah. it's it's undeniable that you can approach Marshall Jassiz and several other authors with, if I can, if I may say so, with a queer eye, right? It is there. Um, but I think Emmanuel is, is correct. We don't see like images, pictures of, of uh, like, like she said, queer uh, images of those authors. So maybe it is a point, it is something to be studied in Brazil. I, I don't have an answer. I don't know why. Sorry. César Gemelli, um abraço, César Gemelli, um abraço. Disse o nome aqui agora. Sorry, sorry guys. No, I was going to say. Hey, Tia, como é que tá? Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, so we can stay on on this call as long as you like. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording um, for the session, and if anyone needs to get off, uh, you're welcome to. But I I will leave the Zoom room open as long as you all are interested in staying on and discussing. Yeah, thank you very much, Megan. So our thanks to Marlene Linares, Megan Haston, and we hope that more of this, this events, these exchanges between universities that we continue to have it. It's really great, this initiative. Thank you all I for would like to thank you all once again for being here, for bearing with me. Um, I have been, I had to manage all this technology and and I managed to not uh, spill more water in the, at the table. That's good. Um, um, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to be.